Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today, Raul Davis. He's the CEO of Ascendant Group Branding, which is essentially the strategic essence and nuances of CEO branding and CEO reputation management. His company is the number one, number one ranked minority owner, uh, owned PR firm in the country three years in a row, and a PR News top 10 agents, top 10, top 100 agency. Raul has participated in small business discussions at the White House, United States Senate, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and University of Pennsylvania. And his specialties include public relations for executives, corporate branding, CEO branding, social media maximization, and strategic brand planning. Raul, welcome. Great to have you back here. Talk a little bit about the concept, I guess, of CEO branding. It's certainly an intriguing, intriguing type concept. How'd you get started in that? Yeah, so it, it goes back to, uh, I wasn't exactly an overachiever in high school, graduated a 1.87 GPA. My, uh, <laughs> my, my dad told me if I didn't get a 3.0 my freshman year, he wasn't gonna pay for year two, so I magically got a 3.0. So um, as I entered in my sophomore year, I started getting more involved in leadership and eventually I got in student government and I booked a speaker on campus, uh, the hip hop artist KRS-One. We had 1,100 students there. And I just said to the speakers bureau we were working with, I love what you guys do, do you have any internships? They said, no. I said, well, can you give me one anyway? So I started booking for speakers, booking speakers at other universities across the country. And after doing that for a few years, I was in grad school at University of Delaware. Two of the clients from his agency reached out to me and they said, hey, we love working with you. Why don't you start your own company? We'll become your first two clients. So Ascendant launched in 2004 as a speaker management company. It took a couple years for us to figure out what determines how much someone speaks. It's their popularity or their brand. So we moved into personal branding and then eventually after a few more years of that, we had more CEO clients come in, took a hard look at the market, and realized that the CEO branding space was wide open. Talk a, bit, a little bit more about that. What really is CEO branding? So it's the idea that all of us have two choices. Either you can get branded or you can get labeled. So are you going to shape how the marketplace sees you or are you going to allow it to happen? I think about it a little bit like uh, NASCAR in the sense that all the cars are high performing, all of them have great pit crews, but what's the difference with every car? The driver. And so as CEO, you are that driver, you are that chief storyteller for your business. And the question becomes, do you feel like that message should be out more in the market? If the question is yes, then you have to realize Business isn't just B to B or B to C, it's H to H, human to human. Why are we all here today? For that very purpose, that human to human aspect. So we've really specialized in terms of developing, how do you build that up and use it as an asset for your business? Talk about, if you could, some marketplace examples, you know, how you bring that to market, so to speak. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give everyone kind of like just a big celebrity example and then I'll talk about a specific client we've worked with. So when we think about Elon Musk and Elon Musk before the last 18 months, if you could bear with me on this controversy, <laughs> when you think about something like uh, SpaceX, are any of us surprised someone like Elon Musk is running with SpaceX? No, he seems like the sort of person who wants to take humanity to Mars. And that's the real magic when it comes to this idea of CEO branding. What is the commonality between who you are as a CEO and what people can see in your business? Because if they see that, you accelerate trust. Uh, Stephen uh, Covey wrote the book Speed of Trust, and that's really what this is about. So, um, you know, an Elon Musk example, what he's done with Tesla, I mean, he was the advertising budget, right, initially. Um, what he's done with SpaceX, and think about it, he had people giving him 10, 20 million dollars, and he told them they weren't gonna get an ROI for like 20 years. Who else could pull that off, right? That's the value of a CEO brand. One of the client we worked with uh, currently is Joe Hart, the CEO of Dale Carnegie Training. This is the oldest, largest training company in the world. Well, Dale Carnegie's been gone for a long time, so how do you make a company like this still relevant when its most famous book came out 40 plus years ago, right? So what we did with Joe 
was essentially help him kind of shape his own narrative around this idea of take command of your life. That turned into a book, that turned into speaking opportunities, that turned into PR connectivity, and he lives the principles of Dale Carnegie, but modernizes them through his take on it. So a simplistic application, we would reach out to chief human resource officers, chief sales officers on LinkedIn, offer them a copy of a book free, no strings along, a lot of people were very appreciative, they took it, and then that naturally led into new business opportunities for Dale Carnegie and speaking opportunities for Joe. Interesting. <clears throat> Can you break down the execution of that, if you could, into more detail? I mean, I know I had the opportunity to work with you on a book several years ago. Talk a little bit more about how that CEO branding can really come to life. Yeah, so, so let's say you're the CEO of a aerospace building company, right? You're not trying to become a global celebrity, but you do want to be a thought leader within your industry, and that's the practical application. So how do you move from being the person at the industry conferences that they ask you to pay the $20,000 fee to speak to becoming the person they organically want you to be the keynote speaker or to do the workshop. So that's where CEO branding comes in. Because if you are seen as an inspirational person, a leader in the space, then they, that's how they want to position you and that's the opportunities it creates. So mechanically you do that through something such as Number one, how do we figure out the alignment between who you are as a person and which way, you, what builds your company, right, and articulate that? Number two, what do we think about a thought leadership position? What is something else you're saying in your industry that can be the three tips, the five strategies, and you get that out in the media, and then maybe you do a four-week series on LinkedIn about that content as well. And you'll be surprised how interested people are in things that hang together well. If you're just going to be sporadic, use ChatGPT to create a bunch of posts because you just feel like it's another task to do and you're checking a box, nobody cares. But if you offer some thought, some insight, some specialization, and you put that in the marketplace, you'll find that connectivity. So is CEO branding, is that good for everyone, every CEO, or are there other avenues they can pursue beside that? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's, there's essentially two kind of categories. So CEO branding is typically for if you're a founder, if you have a business under, you know, 100, 200 million dollars, right? Because at that point, you are seen as pretty much the core of a business anyway. When you start getting to companies over 200 million and maybe you weren't the founding CEO, but you were hired and you're expected to have brought a brand to the table and if you say to the board, I wanna do CEO branding, they're gonna say maybe we hired the wrong guy. Um, we're talking about reputation management at this point, CEO reputation management. And the difference there is that's really about taking a look at your top 10 Google results and how well does that speak for you and the business, right? If there's someone else with your name and they have three or four results, that's brand confusion instantaneously. You are not serving your company well. So how do you end up getting the sort of PR, maybe picking up some additional social presence, maybe doing some speaking events that gives you control of that top 10 Google results so it's not, it lines up very nicely. Then number two, reputation for your company obviously has always come into play and so you don't go as aggressive in terms of some of the tactics that we talk about but you're really thinking about how do you end up being on things like the fortune ceo council how do you speak at davos how do you do the high touch things that really matter at that stage at the level you're playing at very interesting i'm going to ask a couple more questions and then open it up to the audience in talking about the CEO or the leader, the founder of the company, should that be the only person that gets positioned or what about the other leaders, say right below the CEO? Yeah, I mean, so again, if we're gonna think about business as being human to human, then the more you humanize your business, the better, right? And so you can think about this being something that's institutionalized. So the CEO could speak to one set of customers and one target in one industry, 
your, your chief marketing officer can do another, your chief human resource officer can be known to help the company build a great culture in terms of how the marketplace sees them. It's a great place to work. So you can basically divvy it up and be real strategic. We've had a number of companies where we worked with two, three, or four executives and basically figured out how do you cover the most ground and provide the most advantage for the company? Because like, this is not about ego, it's about effectiveness. And it happens to be a very great way to build the top line revenue of a company. So, you know, a lot of PR people will just basically tell you to get visibility for the sake of it. We don't believe in that. I think it should be visibility in front of your target audience in a way that helps them gain more trust in what you're doing. A very directive approach, obviously. Talk about, if you could, really the di dichotomy. You know, you're investing money into your CEO, maybe other leaders, and in the back of your mind, you're worried, you know, as a business, they may be leaving. So I'm putting all this money into them, and they may not be staying for a period of time. Talk up. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair concern, and the answer is you've got to institutionalize the approach. So if executive A leaves, you run the same program with Executive B when they come back in. So you don't think about it as being for the benefit of the individual, though obviously the individual will get benefits, but you think of it more from the perspective of we are doing this for the benefit of the company. So if it's gonna work with CEO X or Executive Y, then it will work with the next person that steps into the role. And guess what? You get your highest level of excitement often when someone new is coming into the role. That creates your highest level of buzz sometimes. So it can, it, so it, so it, it's a program that you can do regardless of what person is in it. So you're really separating the individual from the position. Correct. And is that ever a problem? Because you know, it's like you're talking about Elon Musk and other people, you know, high profile type people. And if you're promoting the position rather than the individual, where do you run to? Well, I mean, so let's take, um after Steve Jobs left Apple, right? Oh, Apple's gonna collapse, right? And what did Tim Cook came in? He realized, you know what? I better be a little bit visible. It's not Tim Cook's natural personality. You can kind of tell, right? But he basically ended up doing that because he realized that that position, people expected something very specific out of that position and he stepped into it. So I don't think Tim Cook's at any risk of like wanting to be a super celebrity, right? But that is what the position required. And you know, um, one of the things we did find during COVID ironically was that we only lost one client because if you are getting personal benefit out of a work we're doing, you tend to cut us last, right? <laughs> so um, it is a thing where the reality of it is it benefits the company, the position, and the individual. And in some ways that makes it, a center I have to give it a high level of synergy. How many people read the Steve Jobs book? Uh, I guess it was by Ian Nucci. Let me see a show of hands. You got one, huh? It's a good book, you should read it if you like reading business books, I can tell you that. I mean, Raul brings a great point. I mean, Steve Jobs was out there, he was the man. I mean, whether you like it or not, a lot of people didn't like it, that's when he got kicked off the board. I mean, it, it, the intrigue of, the, of his position at the time was just incredible. And then when he got kicked out of Apple, and then he came back, I mean, another tremendous story. I mean, they really had a position that from a couple different vantage points. Absolutely. You know, how about the movie? Who saw the movie? Okay. In fact, one of the CEO Club members in New York funded one of the Steve Jobs uh, movies. I don't know which one you saw. He, that was the one with Ashton Cook Kushner. Is that how you say his yes. name? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many people saw that one? That was the worst movie I think I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you. I mean, the CEO guy who, who funded that entire movie he spent a lot, a lot of money and he got his money back from overseas. And then they had another, another movie that came out which was just tremendous. How about some questions for Raul? Who's got them? Rob, I know you deal with reputation yeah. management. Yeah, it's uh, a comment. I worked with Raul back in 2016 when I published my first uh, and only book that was. Um, so he was phenomenal. You should have a sports great conversation with him. We had a good grasp on what's happening, which you can tell. So it's a little bit of an endorsement comment. So hopefully, We'll talk to you. But the question I have is like for me, kind of raised in a way that 
getting out there, like, is not helpful, right? right. <laughs> it's counterintuitive to kind of what I would yeah. want to do. And so you brought up that sometimes it's not people's natural personality, and you've got to be able to look that, hey, this isn't about you or your ego, it's about growth and relevance. Can you talk about kind of how you, you work with people and kind of get them on that up? Because it's so important. <laughs> You know, I appreciate that, and, and it was an honor working with you, and your book did well, and it's, it's done a lot of great things in the marketplace. So, we prefer working like with these sort of clients. In reality, it's probably 80% of our clients, the ones who have super big egos and just want the visibility. We have to charge them a lot more because we know we're going to be a headache, right? Um, so, so, the thing about it is you got to look at it like this. If you believe in your service or product, then it is your objective to figure out every way possible to ensure people have heard about it. And a lot of times, you have to look at it like you are actually doing a service for the marketplace. Because if they don't go with you and they go with someone else, they're being underserved. They're losing out. So it's your responsibility as a CEO, from our perspective, to do everything you can strategically to make sure that they're aware. So if you think about it more as you are offering a service to the marketplace, then you are filling yourself up. It ends up being a lot easier to see the value in. And speaking about books, uh, Raul's company got our book out in the marketplace probably five, six years ago. And it was named one of the top 30 best business books of the year by the American Management Association with their contacts. I mean, so you can't say enough. You have somebody representing you that has those type of contacts, you know, because it's, you can have the greatest thing in the world. If people don't know about it, <laughs> they're not going to know about it. That's part of the promotion. Who else? How do you handle that, uh, that CEO that has the large ego that wants to put himself above company brand, his or her brand, the company. Yeah, so th th this ends up being, this, this can either be a headache or sometimes it could be fun, right? So what we'll do sometimes is think about giving them those couple of wins that will boost for ego significantly because you do have to feed the beast, but we will still gear 80% of our work towards the things we know are going to benefit the company the most. And may ultimately, having an ego, is gonna to wanna to see the company grow and be more successful. So if you end up just feeding both sides of the equation, then you get retention, right? Because if we only feed their ego, at some point you are at risk of <laughs> them getting bored, right? Um, and we had a client previously, um, Bristlecone, which is a division of $20 billion Mahindra, where the CEO worked with us, decided to leave, started a new venture, he hired us for a new venture, and then that company Bristlecone, when they got a new CEO, they hired us to work with the new CEO. So we were able in that case to kind of walk the line tightly. Ken. Um, do you do any branding uh, or reputation building within an organization? So the CEO, the relationship that that individual has with their coworkers and with their organization uh, can be very sensitive and, and sometimes difficult relationship. Most people respond to the CEO, that's the boss, I'm gonna do what they say or I'm you know, I'm going to be on the chopping block. Um, and I find in, in sort of working with an, an organization that the CEO must be true, be true, transparent, uh, open person to their organization. The organization must know who they are and be able to rely and trust on them. Do, do you do any kind of brand building down an organization to benefit the CEO. Yeah, so it's a you very- You might want to summarize that for the tape. Um, yeah, so he, he asked essentially, if there's internal challenges within the organization in terms of brand, how, what role can we play in terms of helping an organization or CEO in that case? And so we have to be careful not to walk too far down the line of executive coach or other sort of consultant at that stage, but there are strategic things we can do. So one of them is that if the CEO is seen out there in the marketplace and talking about how great his team is, 
the team feels better about themselves, right? Exactly. If, if, so you can be talking about culture and you can really gear the CEO to also be helping the sales associates, for instance, right? Like being getting that exposure um, can help with that third party validation. It can be the difference for the sales team in terms of whether someone's gonna pay attention to what you're pitching or not. So we are able to do it from that perspective, being strategic and thinking about how to solve a problem 33% of it, but they have a lot of other work they've got to do if they've dug themselves that sort of hole. Yeah. Good answer. Brian. Um, I am more familiar with uh, like branding the company as a whole. So my question is, if you are a founder and CEO of your company, of a company at what stage would you say someone reaches out to get like CEO brands and after they've already done like the overall company? No, we, we've done a lot of stuff with early stage companies. So there's a company called Three Square that was pre-revenue and they were building homes utilizing shipping containers, but they didn't build anything yet, right? They had 600 page IP manual, but hadn't done any work. So we positioned the CEO as a leading expert on innovating in real estate essentially. And this was before building with shipping container which was more mainstream. So that media work ended up helping them create a $300 million pipeline of potential deals. They closed 70 million of it. They closed seven figures worth of investors and they were able to be seen as a leader within that space. So it can be done early. It can be done in terms of helping you get investors as well. I mean, because at that stage of the company, what are VCs looking at? The team, right? Absolutely. And, and, and if you ever look at VCs sometimes in like these sort of pitch sessions, sometimes you'll notice that they'll throw out this very kind of like strange question to a owner, and it's, it's, they don't even really care about the answer. They care about the temperament, right? So if a person gets worn out by a question, then they're figuring, well, what are they gonna do when things get tough within the company? So your personal characteristics early on in the business is a huge part of what's going to attract people to whether or not do business because your company doesn't have a reputation they're going off of whether or not they trust you interesting concept I mean you talk about especially when there's an issue with a company and if you don't get out in front of it the marketplace is going to fill that void so how do you get out in front of it well I'll give you one even better and Rob and I talked about this that like if you are positively putting out information before the crisis, you get more rope in the marketplace, right? Let's just go back to the 2009 financial crisis. Jamie Dimon versus the former CEO of Wells Fargo, whose name I can't even remember. They roasted that guy in Congress so badly, he had to resign. Jamie Dimon, he slapped him a couple times, but he had had so much positive brand equity that they said, oh, you know, we know it was tough, he moved on, and he's still a machine right now. So that is the stakes of it. I mean, Southwest, I mean, like a few years ago with that, that scandal around the holidays with the travel, that company had built up a lot of brand equity, but the CEO gave a very bad answer. He would have been better off saying nothing. Right? And so, like, it is very important that, if here's, a, here's an example of a CEO, company of a great reputation, says the wrong thing, gives a reactive message, and it impacts the company negatively. So the best thing to do is if you are already known for communicating positively in the market, you build yourself a safety net. Well, speaking of that, how about Boeing? Boeing's in the marketplace right now. Excuse me, Boeing's in the marketplace right now, and they're being... <laughs> They're being sliced pretty thin. Yeah. What should they be doing? Yeah, I mean, and, and in some ways, let's be honest, they've kind of earned that slicing, right? When you have public decisions that, for instance, you're going to put a higher value on DEI than safety in terms of bonuses, that's not like something that's gonna go well with a lot of people, right? So at, at this point, they probably have to just mitigate, blow it over, they can do for positive community service and this and that, but we're going to need an executive that people can trust. Right, and that executive then can communicate in the market, and that will take time. I remember a, f a few years ago we worked with a Chinese company um, who was launching a, a automobile mill at the um, at the uh, Detroit Auto Show, and when we first went out to the marketplace, the media said, 
Chinese companies don't innovate, they steal ideas, and there's a lot of skepticism, right? And then we decided to focus on this VP, Wu Song, within the company, who had a long history of innovation and was talking about how he was bringing that to GAC Motors, and then we got the interviews, and then we got the coverage. So it can save you, right? Like, you have a person with good reputation, then people will think about that individual and weigh that, and that can help a company significantly. Other questions? Comments? Can you share like a specific moment or pivotal moment that's like common that most CEOs make that kind of shift their momentum towards success? Like is there a common decision that's made or a pivotal moment that often happens that where you see like, okay, this is the decision that was made that kind of shifted towards like actually being successful? Yeah, it, it's that moment when they recognize that they are a thought leader. Most CEOs are just like very humble and they think what they're doing, everyone else is doing and it's not a big deal and they're just trying to get business done, right? But when you can see yourself as a thought leader and recognize that you've been successful for a reason and if you can articulate that reason and share it with the marketplace, people are thankful to you, right? It's, again, you're, you're, you're giving a service to them, they're appreciative. That's why like with the media, if you ever noticed, you send a corporate press release, if it isn't that you, you know, raise $70 million, it just goes into virtual trash, nobody cares, right? Um, but if it is a thought leadership, a CEO saying something about what the future of the industry will be, that actually is information that the marketplace is interested in, so, so reporters want to cover that. So I think it's seeing themselves as a thought leader, understanding you have value, and being willing to share that is a big pivotal moment. But the other side of that is some people are successful in spite of themselves. And yeah, I'm sure you've true. seen that. <laughs> How do you handle those people? Well, um, it, it's, very, it's very situational. Um, so, you know, like if someone's tripping all over themselves, then what you try to do is distill things down to the one thing that they do well and just dial that up significantly, right? And you dial that up and make people think about that one thing they do more, more than the three or four characteristics about them that are not as savory. Good point. Leonard. I uh, mentioned apparently he was going with volume. I'm um, curious your thoughts about uh, when the government starts to come after you, it used to be TikTok or uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Well, Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know if you all remember how he was 10 years ago, but he was terrible. Like, if you think he's bad now, he was 20 times worse then. So he clearly has had media training. Maybe, I don't know, he is the um, beta model for a chat GPT humanoid, you know, I don't, because someone has worked on him in some way. And so while he still has a long way to go, he's gotten a lot better and I think it's made a difference, right? And like even um, when we saw those professors at the Ivy League schools in front of Congress, like they were lawyered up, right? And like whenever you are lawyered up and that's who you're taking advice from, you don't sound as human, right? And when you don't sound human, people pounce on you. They will give you a lot more rope if you sound human and make a mistake than if you sound like the lawyered robot. And cost the jobs of Harvard president, yeah. UPenn president, and I think what, Stanford president? Yeah. I mean, they were just terrible. I mean, and the one congressperson, I mean, just, vilified yes. the one <laughs> you should be fired yes. <laughs> other questions for Raul Alex I'm sure like you said it's situational and maybe following you would be step one but if you wanted to head in the direction of CEO or anything what would be your kind of first steps that you would offer as advice on that well let me let me give you an example that you do not need to hire us for this, okay? Your LinkedIn profile. 
if you want to think about what is the one-liner where people can clearly understand what you're doing on LinkedIn? Because most people have generic things. And guess what? That provides no value to anybody. If you're just a CEO of blank company, well, I don't know a blank company because, so I'm moving on. But if you say, you know, you're the leading provider of X because of Y, right, then okay, I can shape a picture. And this is really, at the end of the day, the biggest thing this is about. How are you shaping pictures for someone? What are they imagining when they come across your brand? And because they, ironically, will fill in a lot of blanks for you, right? <laughs> like, if you have a good one-liner and it connects with people, then they will imagine positive things about you and your company and be more likely to engage. So that is like a first step everyone in this room can take is have a strong one-liner for your LinkedIn. That answered your question, Alex? Yeah. Anybody else? Vasilios, you had a question. So, thanks for all the good feedback. I do, I do want to say they had bad lawyers. Being a lawyer, <laughs> I'm not sure they had the right lawyers because they weren't the lawyers. <laughs> had to interact. But as you're saying, they, they were just answering that's okay, that's how we do it. They didn't have a way of explaining to the to the Congress on a question that they should have been coached on. It wasn't about avoiding liability only. It was about how they presented themselves. So they missed the whole thing. Yeah, let me let me reframe differently. They should have had the lawyers and the PR people in the room simultaneously because you're getting different perspectives and you got to weave them together, right? So you can't just think about how do I legally cover my tail? You have to think about how trustworthy do I sound, right? And like a lot of times the lawyer just isn't going to come from that perspective. The best ones do, but like that's not something you can take for granted. So having the two together and getting the advice and integrating it is a way to go. So, so my real question, now that I got that out of the way, is so if you're on social media, for example, right, like you said, is which strategy do you think is small inside the company? Yeah, so um, the question is, how do you go about social media? There's so many different approaches, there's so many platforms. What is going to essentially make a difference, right? And rule number one, you don't have to be on every social media platform, okay? You do not. What you should do is determine how much energy you have for social media, then determine where is your marketplace most likely going to engage, and then focus on those platforms. Once you've mastered that, if you got some more bandwidth to be on other platforms, great. So that's rule number one. Rule number two is don't say things that if you know you read, you wouldn't care about. Okay, <laughs> like we have to be, uh, be real with ourselves. And if you would look at someone's feed and they just provided some inspirational quote and that was it and you wouldn't care, then don't do that as a strategy. Maybe what you can do instead is like not only have a quote, but provide your perspective on it, modernize it in some way, cover the quote from a news story, but give the explanation. So I liked your idea in terms of your providing some insights. They just have to be catchy and concise. There's only two places you can get away with long form content, LinkedIn and Facebook. You cannot get away with long form content on Instagram. You cannot get away with it on TikTok or X, obviously. So you gotta know the platforms, you gotta know the strategy, and you gotta know where your audience is and be candid with yourself. You only have 45 minutes a week for social media. I'd rather you do one post a week on LinkedIn to your audience and call it a day. Any other questions for Raul? Bro, well, if somebody wants to engage you, Alex asked the question, you know, what's the one thing you do? And you said, you know, social media, you can 
do it on your own. But if somebody wants to engage you, what's the process? Yeah, the process is for us to have a conversation. And then from that conversation, we basically put together a plan that looks at where should you be on social, what PR outlets make sense for you, what is the best thing about your company that you embody as a CEO, and then we put together a plan. It may be six months, maybe 12 months, mm -hmm. maybe 18 months, and then it has measurable objectives. So one thing when we decided to go into the PR side of a business that I hated from PR was that people just try, right? Like, no accountability. So we do metrics in terms of media placements, we do metrics in terms of social growth, because we want you to feel more like you're at the car dealership. No one would go to a car dealership and say, oh, I just got a tire, great, right? They want the car. So we try to make it so that there's measurable takeaways from an engagement, and if we haven't met them, we work on our own dime until we have met them. And then lastly, we focus on top line revenue. If you're on the CEO branding side of a business, top line revenue is what we want to help you grow more. So all the strategies are geared to that. If you're on the CEO reputation management side, we think more in terms of return on objective, so ROO. So what are the three things that are going to help your reputation the most? And we focus on that. Love that word, measurable. Ken, Can I just follow up? final question. So um, how would you advise a CEO to build top line revenue? I mean, what is the outreach pathway to help in that area? Because those are two totally. Yeah. So no, no. It, it's it's really, yeah. So um. So he asked, you know, how do you advise on growing top line revenue, specifically looking at something like PR and branding in general? And so it boils down to this: who are who's your target audience? Where do they hang out? Right. So if they're at trade shows then be the keynote or the workshop presenter at, at the trade shows. If you are in a business that um, has CHROs as targets, for instance, LinkedIn, you can really build great relationships that way on that platform, right? And then you can be in SHRM, you know? Um, so it's really about figuring out where is a target audience? What sort of things do they care about as well? Is there a specific industry media outlet that means the most? I'll give you one quick example, and I know we're wrapping up. Um, we worked with someone who was um, doing nuclear security plant uh, sec uh, security, security for nuclear power plants. And I would have thought that the Forbes and the Fortune and all these things would have been the most important things for her, but it actually was Government Executive Magazine. From one article in Government Executive Magazine, she got invited for 20 RFPs. Wow. Okay, my final, final question for you, Raul. What's the one thing, looking back, whether when you started your company or now working with clients, What's the one thing you'd be doing differently, or they wish you would have done differently? Oh yeah, yeah. You and I actually had, had talked about this. So when I first, um, the first several years of a business, I was just a little bit slower to accelerate things quickly because I was like, oh, we got to perfect this model, perfect that aspect of a model. And then in 2019, I went to a Navy SEAL entrepreneur training, and. <laughs> I never did so many push-ups, <laughs> burpees, and all this and that, right? And then by the time we got to lunch, they told us, and I didn't know this going into it because this guy just like had me sign up at the last minute. He said, all right, we're going to jump out of a helicopter into the Pacific Ocean. Mind you, it's 60 degrees outside, and mind you, I don't know how to swim, oh, right? Baby. And so, like, I, I get conceptually the life jacket is supposed to save me, but I still had to overcome it, right? So I get in a helicopter, the guy says, go, 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 I jump in, and that afternoon, I never ran faster, been strong. I was so exhilarated, and then from that point on, I just thought about aggressive growth and really leaned into the business. So my advice, the thing I would change is, not to feel like you have to perfect every aspect of your business because a lot of times growth can allow you to keep building the things you need in your business and perfecting it along the way. Raul Davis, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. See you all. Have a great summer. Great job, Raul.